my name is uh, John Platt. Uh, everybody calls me Jack. Oh, well, you go from there. Uh, in uh, December 7th, 1941, is when the war really came home to me because I was 14 years old, but my brother was at De uh, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, in the Naval Air Corps. And uh, I don't know if you, re you recall, uh, but uh, thousands and thousands and thousands were said to have been killed, which uh, thousands were killed, but not that many. And uh, my mother, who was ill at the time, uh, we tried to keep the news from her because uh, we were told that all of the servicemen were killed and everything else. My brother was 18 years old. He was in the Naval Air Corps station on Ford Island, which was the island where all of the battleships were anchored around. And it was devastated. Uh, the, uh, my father, who had been in World War I, he served on USS Texas. He was a warrior. We were all concerned because my mother was ill. And about 15 days later, a letter came in the mail. Thank God. You know. And it was from my brother telling us how Pearl Harbor was gorgeous. He was down the beach. He enjoyed his living. He never mentioned the war because he knew the letter would be going to my mother. My father, uh, as soon as the war started, uh, he went down to enlist. You know, and they said, you're too old. You know, he said, you're 48, you're 50 years old, too old. This is a, you, know, you were in World War I. Right? Well, two years later, when I became 16 years of age, my mother passed away. Right? And uh, when my mother passed away, uh, my, uh, my father was devastated. So there was my father and I. Now, this was in the early part of 1944. My father just, he sort of lost it. He went and he joined the Merchant Marine. Now, the Merchant Marine was, there was uh, all Liberty ships sailing out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, taking planes, taking uh, food, ammunition, tanks, everything else over to England. President Roosevelt decided to supply Europe before he'd do anything in the Pacific. And that's, that's been a lot of problems in people's mind. Uh, my father left me when I was 16. He went and he joined the, no, joined the uh, uh, maritime services, sailed out of England, and was torpedoed off the coast of Scotland. Uh, I was left alone, so I forged my birth certificate uh, showing that I was 18 years old and joined the Navy. I had to quit school. I was alone, and uh, <clears throat> it was difficult at that time. Uh, I went in the service. I went to boot camp. I was in boot camp one week when they called me in the office, and they said, hey, you know, you, we found out that you preserved, you know, you, uh, you forged your birth certificate. You're only 16 and 10 months old. And they said, why would you want to do that? And they said, we can't keep you here. And I said, well, my, my father was torpedoed off the coast of Scotland. My brother was at Pearl Harbor December 7th. You know, and I said, I come from a Navy family. My grandfather was in the War of 1898. And one of the officers looked over at me, and he pointed his finger at me, and he said, son, you're staying in the Navy. When you finish boot camp, you'll be of legal age. You know, boot camp was, uh, was 10 weeks. And so by the time I finished boot camp, I was legal. Uh, from there, I went to uh, aviation gunnery school in Norman, Oklahoma, <clears throat> because I was growing too tall. I was starting to grow very, very tall. So uh, I washed out. Uh, I was too, too tall to uh, fit in the, an aircraft as an aerial gunner. So they sent me to uh, Camp Pendleton, California. They said, you're going to send you to beautiful California and uh, to a beautiful area called Camp Pendleton, the largest marine base in the world. And I said, why am I going to a marine base? And they said, you're going to the amphibious forces. We're going to give you your own little boat. You're going to learn how to drive your own little boat. I, I'm 17. I said, I'm going to have my own boat. Uh, I didn't know it was a landing craft. No. Uh, we practiced with the Marines, then we went to Treasure Island in San Francisco and shipped out of there for Pearl Harbor. 
From there, we went to the Caroline Islands and the Marshall and Gilbert Islands and went into Lady Gulf. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we took Marines ashore with our landing craft. It was about the fourth day, it was about the fourth day the underwater demolition teams had, they had blown up a, what they do is they go ashore and eliminate all the debris for a landing craft coming in to the shore if there's anything there that the, the Japanese had put down to uh, impede your progress into the beach. And about the fourth day, I was bringing in chow and ammunition. And uh, I was about 100 yards offshore, and that's all I remember. Must, they said it must have been a, a mine that fl floating by or something. And I, uh, I hit the bow, just blew up, and I went in the water. And I awakened on the beach, and the corpsman was over me. And uh, I thought it was funny, because he was, he was uh, talking, but he wasn't saying anything. You know, his mouth was going, and he didn't say anything. And I, I said, that's funny. I, and uh, I didn't realize I had two blown out eardrums. I couldn't hear a thing. He was talking to me, but I couldn't hear him. You know? And uh, it was, uh, I was frightened. You know? and, uh, they took me to the field hospital, and, and uh, I could remember laying, laying in that uh, bunk, hot, hot, 120 degrees. There was Marines also in the, and uh, I couldn't hear a word. The doctor would come by and write on the slate, telling me that uh, we're giving you penicillin shots, and eventually dry up your inner ears, and your hearing should come back somewhat. And uh, eventually it did. Uh, and I wound up, they sent me over to uh, Tacloban, which is the capital of Leyte, uh, to a hospital to be checked out. This was about a month or two later. And on August the 10th, 1945, it was 9 o'clock at night, and I was waiting for a hop on the plane. They had an old B-24 They used to run back across the Gulf as a, as a transport. And I was standing in a any aircraft pit. They had a uh, they had the B-24 strip was lined with uh, any aircraft guns and and uh, searchlights. When there was a condition red, they would search for the jet planes. And and uh, I was having a cup of coffee with the crew. And one of them was on duty with his headphones on and his glasses, looking up at the night sky. And all of a sudden, he stuck his head down. And he said, uh, he said, some idiot just screamed into my headphones that the war is over. And we all laughed. You know? And then he went back up again. And he's standing there. And, and I can remember seeing his feet, because he was on a stanchion. His feet started going like this. And he started screaming again. And he said, that was a goddamn CO. The CO is in my his commanding officer saying, the war's over, the war's over. We all come pouring out of the little dugout. And this was right on Lady Gulf. It's right on the ocean. During the night, uh, during the evening, I think it was Task Force 58, or there must have been about 50 ships in the Gulf. And as you know, on every ship, there's all kinds of searchlights. There's all, also 20 millimeters and 40 millimeters uh, uh, guns. Every two or three bullets is a red tracer. You know, every two or three is a red tracer. And everybody, every radio shack out there must have got the same message that came through as a radiogram. And all of a sudden, every one of them, you don't put lights on, but all of a sudden, the entire gulf lit up. Everybody put on their searchlights. And everybody started firing everything they could get their hands on into the air. And all I saw was thousands and thousands and thousands of red streaks. There's red streaks of traces going up. So one and nobody was killed by the lead that fell. But that was the end of the war. On the, they claimed the war ended on September the 2nd, but it didn't. It ended on, on August the 10th because nothing happened after that. I have one of the original radiograms that was sent. It's, I have a piece of history. People have offered me a lot of money for it, but for some reason, I just can't let go of it. I'd like to show it to you someday. I should have brought it. 
Uh, it said that, uh, that the Japanese government was willing to capitulate on one condition, that their emperor would be protected. And it was sent through San Francisco, through Geneva, and then through San Francisco, and it was sent out to the fleet. Uh, you know, every Radio Shack uh, received that, and I got one of the original radiograms that came through. You know. uh, that, that was the war was ended for me then. Eventually, uh, I, I come home, and I uh, came back to Massachusetts. Now, I had quit high school. I had only been in my junior year. I came back, and uh, I found out while I was in the service that uh, you must have an education. I mean, it is absolutely essential in this world to have an education. It's a shame that so many children don't realize that. But I was fortunate. I had no money, but the government came up with the GI Bill. <coughs> I actually went back to high school. I went back to high school for finished my senior year in, in uh, Boston. I went to the High School of Commerce and the High School of Latin. And then from there, I went to uh, Bryant and Strutt. I wanted to be a, I decided I wanted to be a CPA. And I went to Bryant and Stratton uh, uh, Business College and Boston University. And uh, I graduated. And I went on from there with my life. I was married, had three children. And uh, I was very successful uh, as far as, uh, uh, as, far as a, uh, education and an occupation was concerned. I had various jobs. And, and uh, I wound up. Uh, retiring in 1990, back in Boston. And my wife and I, we, uh, I decided that I had it with ice and snow. Uh, although I loved New England, I taught my three daughters how to ski. We skied all over New England. But uh, when you're getting in your 60s, you decide to hang it up. So. And I decided my daughter was already a nurse one of my oldest daughters, and lived in Myrtle Beach. We used to visit her all the time, so we fell in love with Myrtle Beach. So we came down and bought a home in Myrtle Beach. And that's how uh, we wound up there. My wife is English. In fact, uh, there's a woman that has a story. She was small. She used to live through the London Blitz. Here it is. Very few women can understand the horrors of war, but she can. Uh, she had... She had five brothers. Now, there's a task for a man to go into a family with one girl and five brothers. Can you, uh, but uh, now we're talking about 45 years later. Uh, we went to visit her brothers over in England, and this was last July, last June and July. And uh, they're great people. She lived in the Midlands of England, and they had bicycles for us. You can ride bicycles all over England. You can even take them on the train, you know, and uh, visit different, take your bicycle out. It's a great, they have wonderful trains over there. Uh, her and I were riding a bicycle down this country lane. They had, they had little villages and pubs, thatched roofs on a lot of their homes still over there. And we came around the bend, and when we did, I saw the entrance to a cemetery. There was a huge cemetery way out in the Midlands of England. It was near Cambridge, England. And uh, I was taken aback. It said, you know, the English people are grateful, will be ever for grateful for the sacrifices made by the men that lie here. And I went in, it was 5,000 white crosses, and they were all Americans, from the Air Force and from soldiers, uh, but most of them were from the 8th Air Force. And uh, as I walked through those white crosses, many of them had never seen their 21st birthday. And never, many of them, and of course, none of them ever got home again to their families. I sat there in that graveyard, and the tears poured out of my eyes. Because I realized, I sat there and realized that they had only built World War II Memorial in 2004. 
It was the last one built. You realize that the average age of the World War II veterans in 2004 was in their 80s? In their 80s. They couldn't. Many of them couldn't go, go fly to Washington. A lot of them were immobilized. A lot of them are paraplegics. It was too old, too long to drive and everything else. And I had never seen my World War II memorial. So when I got back, and my wife encouraged me, I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter, and it was published in the Sun News. And uh, my, the letter has said, uh, has anyone, any World War II veterans out there have yet to see their World War II memorial? I think it's time that we see the World War II memorial. I don't know exactly what I said. It's in, the, it's in my book that I have here. But I said that I think it's time that we see the War on the Two Memorial before it's too late. And I think the people of the Grand Strand area of Myrtle Beach should fund the possibility of these men seeing their World War II Memorial because they've already paid with their sacrifices. I said, anyone interested in going, give me a call. And anyone interested in helping the cause by donating, I gave my name and us. And, uh, I figured that maybe I could get 35 veterans and rent a bus, and maybe we could go down overnight and see the memorial. Well, the Sun News published the letter, and then uh, the Myrtle Beach Herald called me up and said, we read the letter in the Sun News. We want to publish it too. I said, fine, well, they published it. The Conway Independent, Guy called me up. He said, I read your letter. My father was in World War II. He said, I'm going to publish. He published it. And uh, all of a sudden, my wife and I, from 7 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, the phone started ringing. I didn't know there were so many World War II veterans still alive. They were dying. The national average said they were dying at 1,100 a week. I started getting phone calls. My wife was getting phone calls. I'm a World War II veteran. I'd like to go on a trip. I want to go on a trip. Our mailbox started getting filled with letters and donations. I mean $10, $25, $5, $50. $1,000 check was sent. I got a phone call from a man who said, my father was in World War II. I am the vice president of Blue Cross and Blue Shield here in Myrtle Beach Division. I'm sending you a check for $5,000. I said, wow. Lou Krieger of 106.5, he's a disc jockey, called me up, said, Jack. He said, I have decided to join you. He said, we are going to go and take these veterans to see their world moment to the world. He would get on his radio station every day, every morning, and he would never ask anybody. He said, I want all of you people, you better donate. All of you people better donate. He said, I'll get your names and I'll tell them if you don't donate. Oh, he was a tiger. He was a, absolutely, he, he, he went all out. He, he said, he said, and, and uh, Liz Galan, he's the chairman of the county council in Myrtle Beach, you people better get your act together and make donations. He called up the mayor of Myrtle Beach and said, the city council damn well better start making do <laughs> well, what happened? He called me up and he said, guess what? I said, what? He said, they want us to appear before the city council, you and I. I said, after you called them names? He said, left. He said, yes. And he said, they want us to appear before the county council. I said, wow. So we went before the city council. We went before the county council. We went before the, uh, the Conway City Council. They all made donations like three, four, five thousand dollars. I got the one I loved the best. I got a, a open a letter one morning, and there was a ten dollar bill in there, not a check. It was from a lady in Conway, and she said, "My husband was a World War II veteran. He died last June." She said, he would love to have gone on this trip. She said, I'm sending you this $10 because I'm on Social Security and this is all I can afford. She said, but do me a favor. When you stand before 
the memorial in Washington, D.C. And this is when I get all choked up. She said, mention his name, and I know he will have closure. So I'm sitting with my wife reading the letter. We're both crying. And uh, I kept that letter with me in her name. And when I stood before the memorial, I mentioned her na his name and a bunch of others. A uh, city councilman asked me to mention his father's name. If I stood in front of the South Carolina, they have different memorials, and uh, it mentioned his name. Well, I did. At any rate, uh, I was able to get 120 veterans signed up. They were able to go. I had about 160, but the rest of them, they couldn't make it. They were in wheelchairs, paraplegics, and all of that. Uh, so I called up Myrtle Beach Direct Air, and I talked to a wonderful lady. She was the chief executive officer, Judy Troll. And I said, Judy, what would it cost to rent an airplane? I said, I, gotta, I can't take buses. She laughed. And she said, about $36,000. And I had, at that time, I had about 30000 I said, I want to lease an airplane. I said, if I have to pay the rest of it, I'll do it. I said, we're going to go by air. And she laughed. She said, well, let me see what I can do. And uh, she said, I'll tell you when you're able to go. She said, I can only lease the airplane when it's, when it's available. And she came up this November the 10th, one day before Veterans Day. She said, if you can make it then. And I said, absolutely. In the interim, that was about a month and a half. Uh, I not only had $30,000, I'll tell you, to make a long story short, I collected and I received a total of $72,000. $72,000. Judy Troll called me up and she said, Jack, she said, I'm going to make a donation to, I'm going to reduce it $4,000. She said, it'll only cost you about $32,000. She said, that's my donation. And she said, you'll have the plane, fly there, fly back. You'll have, and all of that, and the plane will wait for you until in the morning, come back at night. And uh, so I had to have a meeting. So I, had, I called all the veterans. My wife had to make hundreds of phone calls to gather all, the ma all of the veterans and their wives. There's a place called Legends in Concert. And the woman donated the legends, and the woman who owns it donated the Legends in Concert as a meeting place. And I had all the veterans and their wives, the media, Channel 15, Channel 13, everybody came. And I held a meeting. And I gave them all a schedule of when we were going to leave, what we were going to do, when we were coming back, where they had to be, and all of that. And then the legends put on a big show for them. You know, their, their, uh, their show, they put on a big show. And that's where I passed out all of, I bought 120 of these hats. And I passed them all out. Other people donated things, and they all got a ditty bag full of. I went and I bought 120 one-time cameras. This is with all of the funds I had. And they all got a camera. They all got a hat. They all got all kinds of uh, uh, good things and told them when we were leaving and when to be there and everything else. And then I invited Channel 15, Channel 13. I invited all the editors from those three papers to come along, Lou Krieger. And it didn't cost anyone a nickel. Everybody, we, we, we went. I, I, uh, uh, I had some interesting veterans. I was telling this young fellow over here about one man, uh, a woman called up and said, I have a man I feel should go on this trip. And I said, what's his name? She told me his name. I have it at home. I didn't bring it with me. He was in the Bataan death march and survived. I think you know what that was all about, how they were, if they tripped or fall, fell, they were bayoneted and shot. 200 of them lost their lives just making that walk to the prison camp. Along that route, they had to walk, and if they stumbled, they were shot or bayoneted. A horrible experience. And he spent three and a half years in a Japanese prison camp. I had another fellow, he lived in Conway. Mike Fitch is his name. He went ashore on D-Day. And uh, uh, he, uh, he was wounded. 
and uh, he survived. I had another fellow that flew uh, 25 missions over the hump in Burma. I think you know, if you have your history, you know what that was. People that were in uh, B-17s flew 25 missions. I had uh, one fellow, uh, he was in the Navy, and he came to me and he said, Jack, he said, uh, uh, he said, I think I can go. He said, my, he said, if I stumble, can you, somebody help me? He said, can I bring my wife? I said, no women. I, can't, I don't have enough seats. I can't take. A lot of the wives wanted to go, but I couldn't take them. And I said, I'll take you. I'll watch you. No, I said, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll watch you. You'll be all right. And uh, I said, where were you? He said, I enlisted in the Navy. He said, but I told him I didn't want to kill anybody. That's not my nature. And they said, well, what we'll do is we'll make you a corpsman. A corpsman is a first aid man. Those are the bravest people in the world. They don't go ashore with a rifle. They go ashore with a first aid kit. And guess where he went ashore? He went ashore on Iwo Jima. He was halfway up the mountain tending to a wounded Marine with his first aid kit when they raised the flag on Mount Suribachi. He said he heard another Marine yell, and he turned around and he looked, and he saw them putting that flag up on Mount Suribachi. What an experience. What an experience that would have been. And uh, it's funny, when we went to World War II Memorial, I made sure we had three buses. The Myrtle Beach Chamber of Commerce supplied the buses. They made donations. They, they had the buses waiting for us when we landed. And uh, we also visited the Iwo Jima. I had a lot of Marines on board. I had four particular Marines. You might like this story. I got a phone call. It was a woman. And uh, she said, uh, I'd like to go on a trip that you're advertising. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, I can't take wives. I said, uh, only, I only have enough seats for veterans. She said, I am a U.S. Marine. She said, and I went in in 1943. Once a Marine, always a Marine. You know, she was yelling, in the, I'm a Marine. And I said, you're going, you're going. And, and uh, uh, it was so funny how she, she, well, I'm a Marine. And she said, can others go? I said, there are others? She said, yes. She said, I'll have my other friends call you. I had four or five others called. They called up, and I said, why? She said, we're in the Marine Corps in 1943. I said, you're going. I have a picture in that book of these ladies. They're all about 85. They were the life of the party on board that plane. You know, everybody was ribbing them, all of the, all of the fellas. They were all the same age. You were in the Marine. One fellow said, I was in the Marine. She said, you're damn right I was in the Marine. She's on board ship, on board the plane. What a time we had on that plane. But uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, when we got back, we landed that evening, and, we, and all of the wives and friends and sons and daughters were waiting to pick up their veterans. St. James ROTC was there in full uniform. We didn't know this. They were lined up inside the Myrtle Beach Airport, and as we walked out, they had to cross swords as we walked through. Cut me off. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I had. $27,000 left over. No, <laughs> it's not my money. You know? And I, I said, I have, to, I have to dispense with it. It, it. it just preyed on my mind. So I made a donation to the World War II Memorial Fund in Washington, D.C. to perpetuate the World War II Memorial. I sent them $9,000. The DAV runs a, a veteran's van from Myrtle Beach to Charleston once a week for the veterans that have to go to the veterans hospital. Well, their van has about 180,000 miles on it and was falling apart. So I gave them a check for $9,000 to restore and help with the fund for that van. In fact, I got a call the other day and he told me, he said, we're finally getting our new van. You know? And in Walterboro, South Carolina, they built a brand new home for World, II, World War II veterans, any veteran, in fact, any veteran of South Carolina can go there if they wish. It's all paid for and everything else. I sent them a check for $9,000 to perpetuate 
the World War II fund. And not only that, they, it's paid for by the state and by the federal government, but nothing else. They wanted to build an outside picnic area for the veterans so they could set out in the sun and everything else. So I sent them a check for $9,000 for that. Uh, that uh, just about ends my story, except that I keep getting calls from schools. Uh, I was, last week, Ocean Bay Middle School asked me to come and speak to the students and tell them basically what I told you. And St. James High School and uh, a number of other things. It goes on and on. But uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, the one thing that the editor of the paper said, don't ever think that one man can't make a difference. He said, here is one private citizen. He decided to do something, and one man, what happened with his dream? What happened? One person can make a difference. Don't ever think you can't. And uh, I've always proud of uh, him saying that. And I feel very proud of what I was able to accomplish. Because, really, I'm no one special. No. But uh, I did something that will always live with me for the rest of my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and. Good. And uh, you're going to uh, make some copies of these. Oh, yes, sir. We're I have, I, my daughter made a DVD and she said it to music. I'm not going to tell you who's singing the song because it's going to surprise you. But you can, if you want to play the DVD and get it back to me, it's the only one I have. Also, my granddaughter in South Bend, Indiana, believe it or not, South Bend, Indiana, she was so, she'd been talking to her. And, and then also, hold it up a little higher. Yeah. yeah. And, and then perhaps also, to just to hold this up, sir, so that. So oh, uh, this is a DVD of uh, our, actually, it's a DVD of our entire. I'll take these off, of our entire trip in a synopsis form. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's uh, very nice. I didn't know that my children are uh, there, there. Sometimes when they were small, three girls, I could have strangled all three of them. But uh, all three of them live within 15 miles of me here in Myrtle Beach now, and they're all their grandmothers. No, and uh, I just love them to death. They can't, uh, they turned out to be really great. <laughs> Here they are with, uh, what's his name? He's the Weather Channel. Yeah, yeah. there's the four. I trust you. <laughs> are they cute? Yeah, you. <laughs> well, this, this is a wonderful book. I thought you're going to. We're going to scan that. Oh, okay, yes. good. <laughs> and, and Mr. Uh, Platt, we're going to try to make a copy of that. Oh, you can make a copy of that, yes. Very good. Uh, yeah.